Well, these fish are having a bad day, aren't they? I was out walking in my local nature reserve and discovered that the natural wildlife pond was almost completely bone dry, with just a tiny slither of water left, leaving them exposed to predators, as well as the heat and diminishing water quality. So I wanted to see if I could do something for them. I ventured out into the gloop to see if I could make their shallow pond deeper, but digging it out with my hand wasn't that effective. So I decided to build some tools. Here's my new little box scoop. But even using this, I couldn't make the puddle very deep. Though I was happy to see making a pool a tiny bit deeper did have them swimming straight for it. You may know that I love fish and I keep some of my own. So I decided on a plan B. I went home to pick up some supplies and to wash off the sludge. I was actually a bit worried when this black sludge wouldn't come off before I remembered that I just picked all these berries. So after I had a soap free bath, I treated the water with dechlorinator and poured it into the largest rucksack that I had that was lined with a waterproof liner. Then I picked up all my supplies like I was going on a little camping trip and went back. Do, do, be, do, be, do, be, do, be, do, be, do, be, do. Look at this poor meadow. Oh man. I assumed all of the big fish snuffed it when the water level went down. And let me tell you, I ran when I saw this guy. Oh, I put my hands in that water. I could have been eaten alive. What are you? Are you a snake? Are you an eel? Okay, I'm sorry. It's just, you were a bit of a surprise. I started by adding some water to the main pool to see if I could just raise the water level a little bit. Before this, the fish were swimming on their side to get to the different pools of water. So I wanted to try and join them up. I also added some water to Mr. Eel's pond and just that tiny bit of water and they're able to swim freely through all the different ponds. Here's the before picture. I added a little bit of fish food. Fish eat a lot during the summer so they can stock up for winter, which will be tricky for them in such shallow water. I did find one fish that had been left out in the sun, so I thought I'd see if I could treat him at home. And he played quite the Uno Reverso card on me. Nothing wrong with you, mate. If it doesn't rain, I'll pop back again tomorrow and see if I can take more water. And when it's safe, this guy can go back too. Part two of trying to save these fish from a drying out pond. After adding more water and taking one poorly fish home, I found a community group for the Nature Reserve on Facebook. They too have been increasingly worried about the water levels and in recent days have rehomed over 300 fish. But here's the crazy thing. This pond isn't supposed to have fish in it at all. And all these fish are likely to be the offspring of abandoned pets. Once I knew it would be okay for me to take them, I went back down about an hour later to get the rest of the fish. But when I went back down, all of the fish were gone. And I assumed from the footprints that somebody had come to rehome the rest of the fish. But I do have some really sad news about the eel. I don't know why, but it didn't make it, which I was pretty gutted about because it closely resembles a critically endangered species. Even though the fish were gone, I waded in to see if I could find any last survivors. I found two more completely in the mud and put them in my watering can. This may look like completely normal behavior, but they're actually gasping for air, which is quite common with nitrate poisoning. I made their home as comfortable as possible and crossed my fingers that they would pull through, but they too didn't make it through the night. I set out to try and save these fish, but didn't end up saving any. And I can only hope that the water that I put in yesterday gave some of the fish that were rescued a better chance of survival. So all that was left for me to do was to pick up as much of the rubbish as I could and find a bin for it before walking home. I thought I'd just come and have a little look at the pond. This is part three. As it rained for about an hour earlier, never know what might come out from underneath all of that sludge. I decided to make a report to the Environment Agency because people mentioned in the comments that sometimes eels live inside the mud and that when I saw the eel be very still, it could have just been in shock. It's probably wishful thinking, but at the very least, if the Environment Agency can confirm if it's a European eel or not, at least we'll know they're in the area. It's left us with a bit of a mystery. I've asked for an update when they know more. They may or may not be able to do this. I'm sure it's a really busy time for them at the moment. If I learn more, I'll be sure to let you know. This is part four. Here's your update on Mr. Eel. This lollipop is his pond on Google Maps. And this wiggly line is the closest watercourse. And here's the massive A road in between them. Unbelievably, at some point in the past, Mr. Eel left this watercourse and made this incredible journey, crossing this major road into the nature reserve. Here's the thing. Eels can travel for a short distance over land, but how he achieved this distance is a mystery even to the environment agency. As promised, their fisheries officer made an assessment on the level of the water and decided it would be too high risk to move the eel. This is because these two watercourses aren't linked and the risk of transferring harmful diseases is too high. And just hours after receiving their update, 
This happened, and the water level shot right back up. European eels are very hardy, and now that I know that they can live in mud, I'm more confident that he's still around, though I suppose we'll never know for sure. Are you in there somewhere, Mr Eel? Part 5, The Mr Eel Saga I thought I'd pop down six months later to the lollipop pond to see how the water levels were coming along. It's now in the middle of winter and as you can see we've had absolutely loads of rainfall. It hardly looks like the same place and the water level is almost up to the viewing platform. I'm going to go down onto the viewing platform to see if I can spot Mr Eel. The pond is so flooded now that I'm not sure if I can even get past. I feel like I'm taking my life into my hands here. But don't worry, I did eventually make it. I spent a really long time looking at the water but I couldn't see any movement at all. Disappointed not to see him and sad about the new litter like this chair. Part 6. It's about a month later and it has not stopped raining. So much so that if I wanted to go to the viewing platform I wouldn't be able to. There's no way to get past anymore. Does anyone else find it creepy when somewhere you used to be able to walk gets flooded? <laughs> I don't know it just creeps me out. Someone in the community group for the nature reserve said they'd spotted a large goldfish in the pond. All of the fish were removed in the summer when the water levels got low but since fish were never supposed to be in this pond people have been encouraged not to restock it so that newts and other wildlife can enjoy this space. Oh, there's the chair. As it happens, the big goldfish disappeared after a visit from Mr. Heron. I still didn't see Mr. Eel, but I'd like to think that in the dead of night, he sloped off and joined a different waterway. Oh, he might just be hiding in these reeds. What do you think happened to Mr. Eel? And that's it for now. But before I go, I wanted to show you a before and after one picture in the heatwave and one as it is today after a heavy downpour. <laughs> 